Hello, welcome back to my channel. If you are new to my channel, my name is Absolutely Sha and welcome. Um, once a week, I like to come to you with a true crime story. So if you are a true crime fanatic, just like myself, then I invite you right now to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and every time that I upload a new video, you will be the first to be notified. Now, last week I came to you with a story about a guy and he was pretty horrific. He liked to make, you know, house goods out of human skin. Now, if you are interested in that story, you want to hear all about it, then go ahead and check out my last video. Now, this true crime story that I have for you today, let me tell She's like almost the female, um, she's almost kind of like the female egg guy, the guy that I talked about last week. Like, this is like his counterpart. Like, the person I'm referring to is Catherine Knight. And... I, you know what, if you are ready, let me just tell you about her story because it's quite horrific, just like Egon's story was quite horrific, okay? Okay, so Catherine Knight. Catherine Knight is the first Australian woman to ever be convicted um, with a life sentence without the possibility of parole. So yes, this story happens in Australia. Now, Catherine was born October 24th, 1955. And before I tell you what led up to her conviction, um, let me give you a little background story with Catherine. <coughs> now, Catherine's um, mother is Barbara Rome. Now, forgive me if I'm saying her name wrong, but her mom's name is Barbara Rome, and Barbara lived with Jack Rome. And they lived in this small town um, in Amberdeen. And Barbara started a little bit, she started some controversy there in that small town of Amberdeen now. So, apparently, or allegedly, well, it's not no allegedness. This is true court. This is facts. Barbara, Catherine's mom, um, started having an affair with Jack, co-worker and friend. So Barbara starts having a, an affair with her husband's co-worker and friend, and that name is Ken Knight, okay? This was such a big, huge scandal in this small town that Barbara and Ken decides to leave town and they move to another town um, called Maury, right? Now, scandalous, right? <laughs> So, Barbara has four sons, though. So, the two oldest ones stays um, with Jack, and the two youngest ones are sent to be raised by an aunt in Sydney. Okay? Now, Barbara then goes on to have four additional children with Ken, including a pair of twin girls. Okay? In 1955, she has twin girls. Now, Catherine is the youngest of the twin girls, okay? Now, in 1959, Jack passes away, and so the two oldest boys come to live with Barbara and Ken. Now, it's said that Ken was an alcoholic and that he would have, um, he would use like violence and intimidation and rape Barbara up to 10 times a day. Like, that is terrible. So, poor Catherine, she really is deeply in a dysfunctional family. So, on top of that, Barbara, for some reason, thought it was okay to tell her daughters intimate details about her sex life. And she will also talk to her girls about how much she hated sex and how much she hated men. Like, what? Why is that? Why does she think that that's okay? Like, that's just something you simply just don't do. Like, you are not going to sit there and talk to your girls about 
intimate details of your sex life. But okay, for some strange out reason, this is what Barbara did. Now, I'm not sure how old um, Catherine was, but it said that at one point, Catherine went to Barbara um, to complain about one of her, I guess, boyfriends at the time. He was like talking to her into doing a sexual act that she didn't feel comfortable about. And girl, Barbara sits here and tells Catherine, just put up with it and stop complaining. I'm sorry. I'm sorry what like what is going on what is going on like that was barbara's response now later it did come out that Catherine admitted that um she was sexually assaulted up until the age of 11 by various family members however she says that her father ken was not one of the people that was sexually assault her and psychiatrists did later confirm of these allegations being true because other family members um confirmed the exact same acts that Catherine was seeing happen to her so so far Catherine has an alcoholic dad and she has a mom that feels as though it's okay to tell her intimate details about her sex life and on top of that poor Catherine was being sexually assaulted all the way up until the age of 11 okay so that poor child just you know she was really really dealing with like a lot so Catherine, however, though, she wasn't really close to anyone in her family other than um, her sister, her twin sister, and she was also close to an uncle um, by the name of Oscar Knight. Now, he was a champion horseman, but unfortunately in 1969, he committed suicide and this just like completely devastated um, Catherine. So she even said at one point that his ghost will still come and visit her. I know. Okay. Um, so shortly thereafter that same year, the family moves back to Amber Dean, um, where Catherine and you know her family, where her mom is pretty much from. Now, Catherine, as a teenager, she um attended Muswell Brook um high school, okay. And classmates remember Catherine as being a bully. And there was also an occasion where she attacked a student with a weapon and she was injured by a teacher. Now, it said that the teacher um, was acting in self-defense. Now, when Catherine wasn't having her fits of rage, they said that she was like a model student. Like she often would get rewards for good behavior. So right then and there, that tells me that something definitely is is going on with her. Like, it seemed like she was just snap at the flip of a switch where she kind of was like this Mr. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing. Like, it seems like at one point she would be okay. And then at the next point, she would go into these fits of rage. <coughs> Excuse me. So at the age of 15, um, Catherine leaves. She drops out of high school. And although she's unable to read and write, she does land a job as a cutter um, for a clothing company. Now, a year later, Catherine leaves that job for her dream job. Are you ready for what her dream job is? Catherine's dream, dream job was to be a cutter. And she gets hired as a cutter, but this time um, she is the cutter of um, awful. So her dream, ugh, why did I say dream? <laughs> Her dream job was um, to be a, a cutter for Awful. Now, Awful is like um, cutting like the inside intestines of animals. And she worked at the local arbitrary, which is like the slaughterhouse, right? That is Catherine's dream job. Now, I'm not knocking it. Hey, whatever your dream is, whatever your passion is, I say go for it. That happened to be Catherine's dream job um was to work in a smaller house now she um does really well at that job because she's quickly promoted to bony and she's given her own set of butcher knives now it's reported that Catherine 
up until the day she was incarcerated that she would keep those butcher knives hanging above her bed and the reason why was she said that you never know when they might come in handy okay interesting she keeps a set of butcher knives above her head all right so let's go into Catherine's love life okay now in 1973, Catherine meets um, David Kellett. I believe that's how you say his name. Again, I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing their names wrong, but I believe that's how you say his name. So she meets David Kellett. Um, and let me give you a little background on David Kellett. Now, David Kellett was an alcoholic. Um, but unfortunately, there were two major incidents that happened in his life that led him um, into drinking heavily. Number one, his best friend was killed in front of him due to a shunning accident. And then in number two, back in 1968, um, David witnessed a train uh, crashing into a bus that killed six children that were on board. Now, David, he helped rescue the injured and he helped remove bodies. And that was just like really, really a lot for him to deal with. Um, and so that led to him becoming a heavy drinker. Now, at the time, David worked on the railways. Um, and because of his heavy drinking, his work ethics was starting to deteriorate. There were derailments due to his shunning. And as a result, he lost his job working on the railways. Now, David then da -da -da -da, gets a job working at the local arbiter. And this is where he meets Catherine's brother. So in 1973, that's when him and Catherine meet. They start dating. And um, it's said that David also was at times, occasionally, seeing Catherine's twin. Now, I wonder if Catherine knew about that because what I'm going to tell you, the events of what she does to um, her significant others, I don't think Catherine, I don't think she knew that he was seeing her sister occasionally. I don't know. But anyway, so he occasionally would dip with the twin sister. Um, and it said that Catherine, like she was not intimidated at all. She would get into physical altercations and that if David got into it with someone that she would like stand behind him with her fist, like she would protect her man, honey. <laughs> Catherine was protecting her man, okay? Now, in 1974, um, Catherine and David decide that they want to get married. Now, Catherine tells David that she wants to arrive to the wedding on a motorcycle. And, honey, that's what they do. David comes through and they arrive at the wedding on the motorcycle. However, David is heavily intoxicated on the wedding day. Now, quickly after they arrive, quickly after Catherine and David arrive at the wedding, Barbara, which is Catherine's mom, quickly pulls him to the side and she pretty much, I'm going to pretty much sum it up to you. This is what um, Barbara says. Barbara tells David that he better watch out because Catherine will F him up if he ever cheats on her and that she will F and kill him. And she tells David that Catherine is missing a few she, she got a few loose screws like she tells him this <laughs> on his wedding day she tells him this right now i don't know if david felt like okay is she telling me this because you know she's just being the overprotective mother she doesn't want me to be with her daughter or is she telling me this because like it's a fact that Catherine is crazy i don't know what david was thinking but apparently that warning didn't bother him too much because he continued on and he went and he proceeded with the wedding and he married Catherine. Now, the night of the wedding, Catherine attempts to strangle David because he fell asleep after them having intercourse three times. So she tries to strangle him on the night of the wedding. Like, like look, David. Barbara tried to warn you. Barbara tried to tell you. She tried to tell you. Catherine crazy. But David, he stayed. 
he married her and he damn near got strangled to death okay now that incident happens there was another occasion where something else happens okay so he he stayed with Catherine even after the incident of her trying to um, strangle him. Now, there is also another occasion reported where Catherine is like visibly and heavily pregnant and she um, cuts up David's clothes and his shoes and she hits him across the head with a frying pan because David came home too late and David came home late after a night of um, a dark competition that he was in and the reason why he came home late is because the poor man made it to the finals so Catherine feel like he should have been home at a certain time so she started cutting up his clothes and stuff and then when he come in she hit him across the head with a frying pan she so then David of course is trying to get the hell out the house he stumbles and falls in front of the neighbor's house um he's later treated and it said that he severely had a fractured skull like come on come on this is what i mean where she has like this dr jekyll mr high like one minute she's okay the next minute she just goes bonkers she goes completely insane now, following that incident, of course, police wanted to file charges um, against Catherine, but she somehow was able to sweet talk David and he didn't move forward with pressing charges. Now, in May of 1976, David and Catherine have their first child and she gives birth to a baby girl and she names her Melissa. Now, shortly thereafter the birth of Melissa, David Kellett leaves Catherine he um, leaves her for another woman and he moves to Queensland. The next day, Catherine is seen around town pushing a new baby in a stroller, like very violently from side to side. She's like pushing the stroller. She's taken to St. Elmo's Hospital. She stays there for a few weeks because she has she's being treated for pro postnatal depression. Um, and so she stays there for a few weeks. Now, she gets released, she takes her two-month-old baby, puts her on the railway tracks, steals an ax, and goes into town threatening to kill people. Now, there was a man around town, I think his name was Old Ted, he was known around the district there. Luckily, he was um, around in the area on the railways and he saw the baby and he quickly removed uh, baby Melissa off the tracks minutes before a train was about to pass. So now they take Catherine back to St. Elmo's Hospital. She somehow says that she's recovered and she signs herself out. Like, first of all, when she was admitted to St. Elmo's Hospital, I don't even think she really was suffering from depression. Like, right? Like all of these things that have happened prior to that leads one to believe that something else is going on, okay? Something else is going on. She hitting her husband across. She hitting David across the head with the with the frying pan, cutting up his clothes. Uh, she's putting the baby on the railroad. She's violently pushing the stroller. Put the baby on the railroad tracks. Like, come on, okay. But anywho, so she signs herself out, signs herself um out, right? Okay. Then this is what happens. A few days later, after that, <coughs> Catherine slashes a woman's face, demands that this woman drives her to Queensland because she's looking for David. Because remember, I said that David left her for another woman and he moved to Queens Queensland. So she slashes this woman's face, demands that the woman drives her to Queens Queensland. They arrive, they stop at a service station. The woman is able to get away at the service station and she's able to like alert police, right? So... In the meantime, Catherine then takes a little boy and she holds him hostage and she's threatening him with one of her knives. And so by the time the police arrive there, they're able to disarm um, Catherine. But girl, guess how they're able to disarm her with some brooms, child? <laughs> like, I'm, the story is not funny, but they have to disarm her using brooms. 
So that's how they was able to disarm Catherine using some brooms, okay? So they take um, Catherine into custody, but at this point, she's admitted to Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. And there she tells nurses that she was going to kill the mechanic at the um, service station because he was the one that fixed the car that allowed David to leave. Then once she got to Queensland, she was going to kill David and his mother. Now, police shares this information with David. So he leaves his girlfriend and he moves back to Amberdeen with his mother to, in, in an effort to support Catherine. Like, the police just told you that she was coming to kill you and your mother and you moved back to Amberdeen to support her? Why? Why? Why are we doing this? But that's what David chooses to do. So August, August 9th, 1976, Catherine is released into the custody of her mother-in-law and David, okay? And so they moved to Woodbridge, which is a suburban of Brisbane. So there she gets a job working at the Dime Moore um, Meat Works, uh, where, of course, you know, because you know Catherine, her, that's, that's her dream job. She likes to work in slaughterhouses, cutting up meat. So she gets a job working there. Now, and okay, on March 6, 1980, David and Catherine welcomes a second child. This time it's another daughter, um, and they name her Natasha. Now, in 1984, uh, Catherine decides to leave David and she moves back to her family home in Amberdeen. Um, while she's there in Amberdeen, she then rents out a house over in Musselbrook, uh, where she gets a job working back over at the Arbor Tour. Now, I believe it's like a year after of her working at the Arbor she has to leave because she gets injured. She get, she hurts her back. So she has a back injury and she decides that she no longer needs to rent the house um, in Musselbrook. And so the government gives her like um, a housing allowance where she can have residence in Amberdeen. So Catherine goes ahead and she moves back to Amberdeen. Now, she then starts another relationship with a guy by the name of David Saunders. Now, in 1986, she meets a guy by the name of David Saunders, and shortly thereafter, he moves in with Catherine and her two daughters. Now, it's said that David Saunders, he also had an apartment um, out in Scone and that he kept that apartment. And there would be times where Catherine go into these jealous fits because she wanted to know what David was up to when she wasn't around and she would like throw David out. And so what David would do is he would go back to his old apartment in Scone and then here comes Catherine. She would follow him back to his old apartment and beg him to come back to her house. And so David would come right on back to her. It's, it's like literally it's like he's like this scorn like he's in this abusive relationship oh my gosh i just don't understand i don't understand now in may of 1987 there was an occasion where for no apparent reason catherine cuts the throat of david's two-year-old dog like that is so disturbing to me because i am such an animal lover and oh my god like that pisses me off so she cuts the throat of his two-year-old dog she then hits david across the head with a frying pan there she go with these goddamn frying pans it's like when Catherine is around you got to hide all your all your frying pans she hits david across the head with a frying pan and this serves to be like a warning to him like this is what's gonna happen if he ever cheats on her like, what? Seriously? Now, in June of 1988, David and Catherine has another child. And this is Catherine's third daughter, and they name her Sarah. Now, with the birth of Sarah, this really prompts David to want to get a house. And so he puts a deposit on a house. And then a year later, Catherine pays off the deposit um, due to her workman's um, comp money that she got her her compensation that she got for that so she pays off the deposit 
with that money um, and she like decorated the house from top to bottom. Now, listen to how Catherine um, decided that she wanted to decorate the house. So it's reported that Catherine decorated the house in animal skin, she did skulls, she used horns, um, she used old riggedy like animal traps, uh, she decorated with leather jackets, machetes, rakes, pitchforks like they even said like the ceilings were like there was no space that was left uncovered this is how Catherine decided to decorate the house again i'm gonna go back to when they took her to saint elmo's hospital and she stayed there for a few weeks and they said that she was being treated for depression no 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 ma'am Something more was brewing. Something more was brewing. It was something more going on with Catherine then. It was something going on with Catherine back when she was in high school and she attacked the, the boy with the weapon in school. Something was going on then. Now, Saunders, David Saunders and Catherine got into an argument. Catherine hits David in the face with the iron and stabs him in the stomach with some scissors. She crazy sick she is sick hit him in the face with an iron and she stabs him in the stomach with uh, a pair of scissors now david at this point is like look i've had enough i am done he goes into hiding um and Catherine, of course she goes to look for him and she can't find him and so a few months later david decides to come out of hiding only comes to find out that Catherine here done took out an order against him and so he's unable to like visit his daughter crazy crazy okay so that pretty much leads to her going on moving on to her next relationship okay so then in 1990 Catherine begins dating um a guy by the name of John Chillingtonworth and so he's a 43-year-old co-worker. And guess where John works at? He works at the Arbiter. And so um, a year later, she gives birth to her and John's baby boy. And they name him Eric. Now, she dated John for about three years. Um, and then she left him, John Chillisonworth. She dated him for three years. And then she left him, um because she was having an affair for some time with a guy named John Price. Now, John Price, poor, poor John Price. Now, John was born, John Charles Thomas Price. He was born April 4th, 1955. Um, and at the time of their affair, he was the father of three children. Now, the youngest um, stayed with his ex-wife because John's marriage had actually ended back in 1988. So the youngest stayed with his ex-wife and the two oldest ones stayed with him. Now, everyone pretty much said that John Price was a really good guy um, in that he was aware of like Catherine's uh, moments of violence, but like, I don't know, overall, she was nice um, to him. She was nice to his daughters. And so she like, in, even though in the midst of their very violent arguments, they seem to have a pretty good relationship. And so she moves in with him and his daughters. Now in 1998, Catherine and Price gets into her argument because she's basically, I guess, saying to him like, hey, when you gonna marry me? Like, you need to put a ring on it. And so Price just wasn't going for it, which probably because he know like all of the violent arguments that they have had, he probably figured, okay, that's not something that I really want to commit to. Well, in retaliation, because Price wouldn't marry her, Catherine here goes and videotapes like some old um, medical kits, outdated medical kits that uh, John had taken from his job. And so she videotapes them and she sends them to his boss. And so his boss, unfortunately, has no choice but to fire John Price. And John Price was on his job for 17 years. 
Like he worked at the local mine, he was making good money and he lost his job that he was on for 17 years. Now at that point, John came home, honey, and kicked her out the house. He was like, you got to go. So um, Catherine then goes back to her home um, in Amberdeen and then word spreads around town about what she had done. And so reluctantly, not reluctantly, but a couple of months later, Jean decides to rekindle his relationship with Catherine. And so at this point, you know, a lot of his friends were saying that they don't want to have anything to do with him as long as he continues his relationship with Catherine. Now, in February of the year of 2000, there have been like a several series of attacks um, that John Price was experiencing from Catherine. And now at this point, he has had he no enough of her. He kicks her out the house. And so on February 29th, on his way to work, John decides to stop at the magistrate's court and he decides to file a restraining order against Catherine um, for an order of protection for him and for his children. Now, it said that when John gets to work, he tells his co-workers, like, you know, if I don't come in the next day, you know, Catherine had something to do with it. And so his co-workers are like, yo, like, don't, like, leave her. Like, what are you doing? Like, please, like, don't go back to the house tonight. And so John Price is like, no, if I don't go back tonight, then I'm afraid that she might, you know, hurt my children. Well, the following morning, it's like 6 a.m., and the neighbor notices that John Price's car is like still outside in the driveway, which is odd. Not only that, his co-workers realized that he hadn't shown up to work. So his employer sends a worker over to the house and the worker and the neighbor, you know, tries to peep, peep things out around the house to see what's going on. So they knock on John Price's bedroom uh, window to try to like wake him up. And then they go around to the front door and they notice blood. Now, wait, let me back up. So <coughs> Price tells his coworkers about this incident that like, you know, if something happens to him that, you know, Catherine definitely has something to do with it. So Price goes home later that evening and he notices that Catherine nor his children are there. So come to find out, Ch Catherine sent the children to a sleepover. And so um, John Price, he goes over to a neighbor's house and then around 11 p.m. that night, he returns home and he goes to sleep. Now, Catherine apparently comes home shortly thereafter. She watches a little bit of television. She takes a shower. She says her and John has sex and... That then leads to the next morning where the neighbor and the worker, the co-worker goes to his home. They knock on the bedroom uh, window and then they go around and to the front door and they see blood um, on the front door. Now around 8 a.m. the police arrive um, to John Price's home and they find Catherine comatose from apparently taking some sleeping pills from, a, from taking a bottle of pills. And they find John Price's body, which apparently shows that he has been stabbed to death. Now, she stabbed him while he was sleeping with her butcher knives. According to the blood evidence, it looks like John like woke up. He was trying to turn the light on. He was trying to get out of the house. It's not sure. They're not sure if like he stumbled or if she like dragged him back into the house. Now, this is where it gets gruesome. This is where this chick like listen, her mother tried to tell the first husband, David Kelly, that she had a few loose screws. And this is where she shows that she really had a few loose screws. Now, later that night, Catherine goes to the ATM with John's debit card and she withdraws $1,000. Autopsy reports that John Price was stabbed over 37 times. 37 times. Okay, sorry, once again, my dog is barking. Every time I do these videos, he starts barking. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to talk over. So, 
Several, uh, several hours after John Price had died, Catherine decides to skin him. And so she skins his body. She hangs the skin on a meat hook on an architrave over the lounge door, okay? She, she decapitates him and she cooks up parts of his body and she serves them alongside baked potatoes, zucchini, uh, beetroot, cabbage, um, yellow squash, and gravy. And she does this in two settings. Not only that, she sets the table for John Price's children and she leaves notes beside each plate, okay? Police also found John's head in a pot of vegetables. Now, in the backyard, they saw a um, third setting that had been thrown out in the backyard. Allegedly, they believed that Catherine tried to eat it, but she just couldn't. She was unable to. Now, the head that was found in the pot of vegetables, it was said to have still been warm. So they believe that she started cooking that like earlier that morning. Crazy. Now, later on, she arranges John Price's body. She has his left arm draped over like a liter bottle of a soft drink. And then she crosses his legs and... There happens to be a photograph of Price with some blood stains and alongside small parts of flesh. I am so sorry that my dog is barking. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so um, the note that was left with the blood stains and the small pieces of flesh, pretty much Catherine wrote that she was allegedly trying to say that John Price had raped her daughter and that his daughter too, um, Beck, had apparently done something to Ross and little John, which is the son, and that now John Price can go do something with little John's wiener, like crazy. Anyway, police later say that those allegations um, are said to be false. So whatever Catherine was trying to imply was false. Now, Catherine's initial offer of manslaughter was rejected and on March 2nd, 2001, um, she was arraigned on a murder charge for John Price. She entered her plea of not guilty. Her trial was set to start July 23rd, 2001, but her counsel got sick. And so they then later uh, pushed it to October 15th, 2001. So the trial is set to start <coughs> just as Barry O'Keefe. Um, he tells 60 potential juries that jurors that, you know, based on the photographic evidence of the case that you know, he's pretty much giving them the option to say whether or not they think that they will want to continue to serve as a juror, a potential juror on this trial. Now, five of them said, okay, that they would. And then once the witness list was read off, even more jurors backed out of it, okay? So like, nobody wanted to have any parts of this. Now, it said that the following day, that Catherine decided to enter a plea of guilty and then therefore the jury was later dismissed. Now, it was said that when the jury, when the uh, witness list had been, let, had been read out to the remaining jurors that the, um, and that those jurors, even more of them decided to leave, it said that the judge adjourned for the next day. Now, it later came out that the reason why the judge had done that is because he wanted basically um, a psychiatric evaluation to be done on Catherine to see if she was fit to stand trial. So he already knew in advance of her plea change that she was going to plead guilty. He already knew that, but he still wanted to see if she would be able to, um, if she was like mentally capable to stand trial. So the judge pretty much wanted to make sure, you know, she could stand fit trial, that she understood what a guilty plea meant. Um, and then it was later also stated that her defense was going to say um, that she was, they basically was going to blame um, her actions due to amnesia and disassociation. 
psychiatrists did say that um, they would consider it even though they did find her sane. Later claims um, said that psychiatrists was going to support that claim um, even though they did find her sane. But then later on, two psychiatrists did say though that they believe that Catherine suffered from borderline personality disorder. Like totally I agree because think about all the things from when she was a child all the way up until this point like that's what I'm saying something else was going on even when she had her first daughter Melissa something else was going on it wasn't just depression that would lead her to you know shake the stroller violently and then put the baby on the train tracks like it was more than depression so the fact that later on at her trial these two psychiatrists say that they believe she suffered from borderline personality disorder yeah, something else definitely was going on with Catherine. Now, no reason was ever given for Catherine's guilty plea. Um, she doesn't take any responsibility for the uh, murder. And so her uh, counsel had asked if she can like be removed from hearing the testimony of, um, of what happened to uh, John Price and so that was denied and so Timothy Lyons he takes the stand and he describes like the decapitation of what happened to John Price and it stated that Catherine like she couldn't even take care in it and she had to be sedated. On November 8th Justice O'Keefe he pretty much said due to the nature of the crime and Catherine having no remorse that he has no choice but you know to give her a tough sentence and so he uh, sentenced her to life in prison with no parole and child he had the papers stamped saying never to be released like Catherine is never getting out period never so that is the crazy incredible uh gruesome story of Catherine knight the very first woman in australia to be sentenced um to life imprisonment with no parole so tell me what did you think about today's true crime story time um give leave me a comment below make sure you like comment and subscribe if you haven't already and leave me a comment below and tell me what do you think about today's true crime story come story time um what do you think about Catherine knight and as always if you have any suggestions for any other true crime stories that you would like me to make a video about please drop a comment below and i thank you so much for tuning in to my video today i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or night whenever you are watching this and i will see you in my very next video bye